Welcome to Sitting with Sally. As you know, we've been doing this show for a while, and Jess Strachan, who's a broadcast technician, often comes up with ideas for different shows. I remember when I was uh, talking to Gloria Alcock, Jeff mentioned he had worked in Alert, the most northern tip of Canada. Yes. Yes. And anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, dialysis. This was Jeff's idea. He has been uh, undergoing di uh, dialysis for about five years. And I have with me Jeff Strachan on my right and uh, Stephanie uh, Preston, who is a, a nurse at the dialysis unit at Lake of the Woods Hospital. Thanks for having me. Welcome both, yes. Thank you. And thanks for your good idea. Well, <laughs> it's a big part of my life right now. I was going to say it's your life. Yes. Yes. So let's start. So uh, dialysis we're talking about is kidney dialysis. Yes. We'll start at the beginning. What do the kidneys do? Uh, the kidneys do uh, three things, really. They filter out toxins and extra water. They uh, uh, provide a balance for the electrolytes, the sodium, potassium, that kind of thing in your blood. And then they also produce a lot of hormones that do things like uh, maintain your blood pressure. Uh, Stephanie could uh, speak more to what, okay. uh, what the kidneys do in that regard. Well, and I was going to say, not to be too polite about it, the reason we pee is because of the kidneys. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's so when they what make the urine. filtrate that it produces ends up as urine. As, and that's a waste. That's that a waste that the body wants waste. to get rid of. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when the body doesn't get rid of the waste? Um, if your kidneys aren't working properly, you're going to have fluid build up um, and it'll look like swelling in your legs and throughout your body. Called edema? Edema, exactly. Okay, so Jeff, what happens when, uh, um, when the <coughs> kidneys aren't working properly? Uh, well, you build up, you can build up fluids, uh, you can build up uh, extra potassium and extra sodium in your blood. Um, that can be controlled a little bit by diet, by cutting back on the amount of especially salt for sodium and potassium, foods that are high in potassium, like potatoes and oranges, uh, things like that. Okay, so we, we obviously need potassium, but too much can be toxic to us? Too much could actually put your heart into arrhythmias and stop your heart. So it's a very small window of where you want the potassium and sodium and the electrolytes to be at. So without the kidneys, you need dialysis to help control that. So levels. it's not just the buildup of the fluid, it's also the buildup of the, um, I guess, potassium is a mineral? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. there's uh, toxins such as uh, creatinine and urea, urea being where the name urine comes from. Um, those are products of metabolism when you... When Protein and muscle breakdown. Those are the yeah. waste products that you have to eliminate. Those yeah. are the two big ones. Yeah. yeah. And if you're not eliminating them, again, the toxins are building up in you. Yeah. So what causes the kidneys not to work properly? Oh, there's a multitude of reasons. Uh, the main one being diabetes. If, you're, um, if you have a history of high blood sugars, they can injure the small vessels in the kidneys. Um, and we talked on another program about diabetes because if you have high blood sugar, your blood gets too thick actually. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that causes damage. Um, there could also be genetic reasons like polycystic kidney disease, mm -hmm. um, radiation, if you've had to have radiation on a part of your body that could damage your kidneys. Okay. And Jeff, uh, that's happened to you a f uh, over five years ago? I, in 2001, I was diagnosed with colon cancer and I underwent uh, chemo, radi chemo and radiation treatments. And that's the other thing, it's uh, chemicals. There are certain chemicals that can uh, damage your kidneys. Um, or is it uh, if you're on an antibiotic tetracycline and it's out of date, like it's past its expiry date, that can damage the kidneys. Too much ibuprofen or uh, cocaine, Tylenol. Co cocaine yeah. heroin, yeah. No. all those things, yeah. not yeah. good for the kidneys. No. Okay. But there's also lupus and other autoimmune disease. Because yeah. everything goes through the kidneys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah lupus is one of the first things that uh, the doc uh, nephrologist, which is kidney doctor, did was test me for lupus. Okay. And one of the things there is the, uh, it's a redness under the eyes. Uh, yeah, they call it a butterfly rash. Butterfly, oh, yeah. yeah. I knew okay. it was yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> so with you, you're in remission from a cancer, but as an effect of a treatment, you now have to undergo yeah. dialysis. Yeah, uh, I'm actually past remission. It would be called cure because it's been more than 10 years. Okay. But cancer is one of those things that keeps on giving and now I am <laughs> in dialysis. Stephanie, explain what dialysis is. 
Well, dialysis is uh, artificial renal replacement therapy for people in end-stage renal disease where your kidneys are working uh, very poorly. Your kidneys aren't functioning. Yeah, your glomerular filtration rate is less than 15. That's how we categorize it. So your stage five kidney failure. Um, so in dialysis, we need an access point to access your blood for hemodialysis. And our patients either have a fistula, which is uh, where a vein and an artery are anastomosed or surgically sewn together. And that creates a larger, plumper vessel for us to insert needles in. Um, they either have this or a central line, typically, which is a, a catheter that goes straight into your right atrium of your heart. So we can either hook up our dialysis lines to the central line or to the needles that are inserted so in the So when you have the needles, you have, you were telling me earlier, one coming yeah. out and one... Yeah, we're drawing the blood from the lower needle you and it's it? circulated, <laughs> sure, circulated through the machine and the artificial kidney dialyzer. Okay, so basically the blood scrubbed. Yeah, yeah. it's... it's and cleaned. this this is the... This is called the dialyzer. And, and that's the filter. there's millions of little fibrous membranes in here. Okay. Um, so your blood is being circulated one way through the dialyzer, and the dialysate solution, which is made up of a reverse osmosis water, a bicarbonate, and an acid okay. mixture, um, that is being pushed the other, other way through the dialyzer, and through ultrafiltration, hydrostatic pressure, uh, diffusion, osmosis, those toxins and extra fluids are being pulled come, away. Come out through the filters. Yes, yeah. but those two mixtures actually don't, they, they don't mix. The blood and the dialysate don't touch. So. And this is part of a much bigger machine? Yes. It looks like a small mini fridge, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, it does. Does. And then it's got, if you want to show your... Well, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, fistula, you see the scar here, that's where the fistula was created and where the two needles went in were these two points right here. Uh, this would be the uh, venous where the blood is drawn out, goes to the machine, and I got that backwards, don't I? Arterial is at the Ar bottom. Arterial, yeah. where it, it takes the blood out, goes through the machine, comes back through the, into the venous. Okay, and when I came to visit you at the uh, dialysis unit, you could see, the, yeah. the, because and it I comes out have, in a clear tube, blood And I still had this, out. yeah. Yeah. But uh, that clotted off. So now I have a central line again, which means a line that has been inserted into my jugular vein on my, in my neck, and it goes down to the superior vena cava, next, the, the big, where all the veins come together next to the heart. And uh, then it comes out under the skin and comes out of my chest right here. So with your arm, every time you go to the dialysis unit, you have to have two needles inserted. Two needles mm -hmm. inserted. Yeah, our needles are uh, one and a half inch long and 15 gauge, like they're big, big guys. Big horse, horse, yeah. horse needs. With <laughs> this, it's permanent. Yes, there's, it's a, for now. There's a permanent catheter which has a Dacron cuff and the skin actually grows around the Dacron cuff as another preventative measure for infection. Um, there all, there's also temporary lines which are inserted that don't have the Dacron cuff and are just used for a short period of time. Okay. And the, the fistula is our gold standard though. We prefer all of our patients, if they have the vasculature, to have a fistula because yeah. there's less chance of infection. Yeah, a lot of people it. think, oh, you know, this is so much better, the, the, uh, the, the catheter. Uh, but it isn't because your skin, uh, your, your body is really good at healing itself. So I get a couple of needles and then they pull the needles out at the end of uh, treatment and within a couple of hours, it's healed up. Right. And we no give, more infection. We give a topical um, numbing oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> product on there, or we use uh, xylocaine with a small needle before we insert the, the yeah. big ones. Yeah. 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 And frankly, to the xylocaine needle hurts more than the big needle. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yeah. And this one, there's always a danger of infection, so you'd, you'd rather go have well, the yeah, needles inserted. I, I have to watch when I'm showering, not to get it wet. Not you can't swim, you know. Yeah. It, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back and learning more about dialysis.
So, uh, welcome back to Sitting with Sally. We were talking about dialysis, and we were talking about hemodialysis that is done at the hospital. That's right. So far, we've been talking about hemodialysis, which we offer at the hospital. Um, patients could also be trained and do dialysis, hemodialysis, in their own home if they have a clean water supply. Um, there's it a, takes longer at home, though. Typically, people do it overnight, and mm -hmm. they run their pump speeds slower, so it does take a little bit longer. But a lot of people choose to come to the hospital. It's a lot less pressure on themselves, um, and they know, well, you know there's, there's someone there's someone yeah. there watching out for them. And there's so, going to be renovations to your house. Uh, you have to have a room. You can't have your pets in that room. Things like that. So yeah. it, it would be useful when there is no hospital or a medical facility nearby um, for people mm -hmm. who are living in isolation, I presume. Yes, um, there's also another type of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, and uh, this is completely different. There's a cavity in your abdomen called the peritoneum, or peritoneal cavity, and uh, you have a catheter inserted here into the cavity, um, and patients use a glucose solution, which they fill into their cavity, and they can either do this a couple of times during the day, a couple exchanges during the day, uh, where they fill themselves up with the glucose solution and then drain themselves and the membrane works um, Just similar to the dialyzer, you know through diffusion and osmosis. Is it as effective? And it is actually you can you can be more lenient with your fluid and your dietary restrictions on peritoneal mm -hmm. dialysis because you're doing it every day throughout the day or during the night with a night cycler okay. so it's a pretty good option if you're uh, physically capable because you have to lift beds up onto an IV pole. Um, but, yeah. And I didn't qualify for that because my cancer was colon cancer, which meant I had, I now have a colostomy. So I would have, if I was doing peritoneal dialysis, I would have the access here and the colostomy here too much. Uh, too, too much hardware. There, yeah. Well, too much uh, uh, chance of infection. Okay. So uh, just before we move on, do quite a few people choose that or do they? They do, yeah. And they put you through an extensive training program for that as well. And they can have supplies delivered to your house um, to make it easier for you. You can travel easier with that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, let's go back to when you first uh, went to the uh, dialysis unit and, and started uh, dialysis. Okay. Well, first, how I uh, became to be uh, diagnosed um, like I said, it was several years after uh, my cancer therapy. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night with a cramp in my leg, and I had been getting a lot of muscle cramps. I woke up, jumped up out of bed to try and put some pressure on it, and immediately passed out. When I fell over, I cracked a rib. And so I ended up going to the hospital and seeing my doctor, and he did some tests and said, well, your creatinine level is huge. I think it was around 200, 180, 200. Normally it's around 90 to 100. Um, so he sent me to the nephrologist, Dr. Walters, Dana Walters. And uh, she said, oh, yep, your kidneys are going down. And they did some more tests and basically came out that it was the radiation. I was pre-dialysis for a couple of years. And then finally my kidneys had progressed or digressed to the point where I needed to go on hemodialysis. So they slowly stopped working? Slowly stopped working okay. because the, the damage just keeps coming on. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, the first day in dialysis, very nervous because you don't really know what to expect. You know, was prepared. They told me what was going to happen, but until it actually happens, That's you're not really sure. And, of course, getting a look at the needles the first time, <laughs> Okay, uh, but the, 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 the cream that you put on, the Emla cream, does numb very well. And your uh, nurses are very reassuring. And the right? nurses are yeah. very yeah. reassuring, always smiling and very happy. <laughs> uh, and they are. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. Yeah. Um, There's a sense of uh, pleasant quietness in the unit that I noticed. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of patients sleep through the whole thing. They try to keep it a relaxed yeah. atmosphere, yeah. you know. I, I once in a while doze, but I know I snore, so I, <laughs> I'm a little self-conscious about sleeping. Um, and the first week, it was, I think, an hour, hour and a half of dialysis, and then the next, and I went every day that week, uh, an hour, then two hours, then to three hours. To get used to it. Yeah, yeah to get Yeah, and we slowly work you up. You're usually a three and a half or four hour treatment, depending on your body mass index, 
depending on how, um, how well you follow your fluid and dietary restrictions. And what are some of the main dietary restrictions? Um, the potassium, the sodium, the phosphates. Mm -hmm. those Potatoes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's three and a half, four hours a, a session, and how many sessions? Three times a week. Three times a week. So basically it's three afternoons or mornings? I, I, I like to say three afternoons uh, a week I can sit back and I don't have to do anything. On the other hand, three afternoons a week I sit back and I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a little half dozen or one, you know, It's six an adjustment, other. definitely. It is an adjustment. And you've been doing this for a little over five years? Yep. yep. What, what other adjustments can you think of that you've come to terms with? Well, uh, I'm on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday afternoons, which means my weekend contain, it consists of Saturday morning and then Sunday. And everybody else, you know, yay, the weekend. My weekend, I know what I'm going to be doing for four hours, and it's not what I want to do, especially in the summertime. You'd just rather enjoy the outside. So that's a big adjustment. And uh, What about travel? Travel is a big thing. If you're traveling within Canada, it's a little easier because there's provincial uh, health insurance. And you just, but you still have to make arrangements ahead of time where you're going. Say, I'd like to get into your unit for you know, the week, two weeks, whatever you're going to be there. Uh, so many sessions and they come back and say, yes, we can accommodate you. You really have to make that well in advance, what? Two, three months. Yeah, yeah. Oh, quite, a, quite an advance. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot that goes into. I guess because the, the the units are fairly booked already. Oh, sure. Yeah. They they you know, it's more efficient if all of their chairs are filled. Yeah. Um, and a lot of well, I would say chairs because this hospital here has chairs. Most uh, units have a bed. Acute facilities have beds. Yeah. Yes. Um, These then, are like fancy lounge chairs. They they look yeah, very comfortable. Yeah. They yeah. Recline. And they've got then <laughs> they got a little table on either side, and you can put your magazine or whatever you want Laptop, on the side. Yeah. Stephanie, yeah. One, of, one of your jobs was uh, doing dialysis on a cruise ship. Yes, I actually went to Alaska and worked on a cruise ship. It was Royal Caribbean Cruise Line and did dialysis at sea for a week. And um, dialysis at sea goes all over the world. It's a, a great opportunity if, if uh, our patients are thinking about it. I really encourage it. Um, so there's another option for travel right there and they do hemodialysis. Yeah, and I, I took advantage of a program run out of Calgary called Getaway Dialysis. And they have two places, Mazatlan and Puerto Vallarta in, in Mexico. And I went to Puerto Vallarta, actually Nuevo Vallarta, which is on right next to Puerto Vallarta. And uh, I was at uh, uh, a hotel there, and it was right across the street, like literally across the street from the hotel was the hospital where I went to. So I three-minute walk. So getaway dialysis, uh, do they have other places besides Mexico? or, or? Uh, They only have the two at the oh, moment, Mexico. or at least when I went. I yeah. haven't checked lately. If there's a destination you're interested in, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure there'll be a dialysis unit there. And you can get that, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, I know a, a person who went to uh, uh, Las Vegas, and out of curiosity, I asked how much was the, how much did it cost? And it was, uh, several hundred dollars more than it was in Mexico per treatment. Uh, so if you wanted to go to Vegas, you would have to, to make accommodation for that because OHIP will pay you back whatever they would have paid the unit here. Okay. Which is going to be a lot less than what yeah. you're going to be paying mm -hmm. the unit in, the, in Las Vegas. Another example of, of um, hospitals in the States are for profit. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, true. So you, you could go anywhere in the States. You could go to Hawaii, you could go to Florida but you'll be paying out of pocket a significant amount. Kenora is a hot destination too. We get a lot of American right. uh, fishermen coming up to dialyze with us. And Winnipeg res residents. True, yeah, cottagers from Winnipeg. And right now you have six units in the dialysis? We six have five stations. Five so we stations. run five patients at a time, so we have a max of 20 patients. And we often have a waiting list, unfortunately. Um, Sometimes in the summer we do up staff or offer an evening uh, rotation so that we can accommodate extra patients. So, so. What so about the, the camp? Oh yeah, we also do uh, kids camp. Uh, we get p uh, patients from Children's Hospital and they come and spend a week at Camp Stevens and we offer them dialysis too. And they come in on the boat in the morning for their dialysis first thing and get to enjoy the rest of the day like any other normal kid. That sounds fun. It's great. And um, are a lot of kids on dialysis? In 
in proportion to adults? Uh, less children, for sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I couldn't give you numbers, but. So you've been on dialysis for over five years. Yep. What is the goal for that? What is the which? Your goal. My goal? Uh, well, eventually a, a kidney transplant. You get a transplant, you're not in dialysis, you're uh, free. Now, you're not totally free because you have to be taking anti-rejection drugs, uh, which will have certain side effects. One of them is, one of the drugs is uh, prednisone, which is a steroid. Um, and steroids cause how, how you to risks? swell mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, there's a lot of risks there. Mm -hmm. There can be some uh, emotional uh, personality changes with uh, prednisone. Uh, increases your appetite. Increases your appetite. Yeah. You tend to gain weight. But on the other hand, you're not tied to a machine anymore. Yeah. Okay. We'll take another short break. And we will be back with more information about uh, dialysis. Welcome um, back to Sitting with Sally. We were talking about uh, kidney transplants, and you only need one kidney. One kidney working at 20% capacity is all you need. Yeah. But once kidneys stop working, there's no way to get them back up. No, unfortunately. Okay. Where do you look for transplants? Uh, first, you would look uh, to your own family. Uh, the closer the relative, uh, identical twins would be perfect. You probably wouldn't even have to take any anti-rejection drugs because you are identical. You have this, the same uh, DNA genetic. Me genetic makeup. And you grew up together, so you've had the same environmental uh, stresses as well. Uh, then it would be a sibling or a parent and uh, af it seems to me after, when you get beyond that, like cousins and whatnot, it's no different than a complete stranger. And then you'll want to get on the transplant list. And the typical wait is between five and eight years for a kidney. And transplant list, that means it's really important for people to donate organs? Yeah, so we really encourage people to sign their organ donation cards. You can save multiple lives. And they are usually attached to the driver's license? Yep, exactly. And or you, you can do it online as well. You yeah. And there, there's, there's a movement to try to get organ donation to be the default, that you have to sign something saying you don't want your organs donated, uh, rather than say, signing something saying you do want your organs donated. But that's not in effect yet. But that the, would be provincial, wouldn't it? That would be, yeah, yeah, in each jurisdiction. The Living Donor Program is great, though. Even if you find a, a donor who isn't an exact blood type match to yourself, um, the program will find a match for that donor and give you a kidney in return. Mm -hmm. so. so someone else has a, mat, uh, a donor that doesn't match them, you have a donor that doesn't match you, but those two donors match the other. Right. So you, you would trade off. And you were saying it can go up to four different As, matches? Yeah, there's yeah. a computer in Ottawa that does it twice a year that takes all of these uh, uh, donors and mixes and matches and finds people that are good for across Canada, uh, like you say it's, it's each jurisdiction which is in charge of transplants, but this program is national. Yeah. And uh, if, if our patients are on the transplant list, we encourage them to have you know, their cell phone on them at all times because you never know when something's going to come up. But there are um, <laughs> the situations where you wouldn't qualify, such as if you have an acute infection or if you have cardiac issues or respiratory problems, um, dementia. So when you say cardiac issues, if you can't undergo the surgery because yeah, of cardiac exactly. issues. Yeah, yeah. your and heart what, can't handle it. And what about age? Well, how old is, uh, well, You know, mm, it's hard healthy? to say. There's a lot of uh, young 80-year-olds out there these days, so mm. I'm not going to comment. Well, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, my, my father wanted to, to get on the list, but my father, they said, no, he's too old. And he has a few other... To be the age, donor. Age, to but be to the be donor. recipient, I think it's a little bit different. To be the recipient's different, yeah. yeah. Uh, an 80-year-old could get a 20-year-old's a uh, kidney um, as long as the 80-year-old is healthy enough to undergo the surgery. Sure. Yeah. You were talking when you first went in to uh, uh, learn about dialysis and kidneys. You went through a whole process, and I understand there's a kidney health clinic? Yeah, the kidney health clinic. You talk to the nephrologist, and you talk to a dietitian and you talk to uh, uh, pharmacist. a social pharmacist and social a social worker. worker, what you should be, and, and it's tailored to you. Uh, Diabetic educator. 
if yeah, when when applicable, yeah, that yeah. didn't mm -hmm. apply to me. I'm not diabetic. Um, but what you should look for, uh, uh, cutting down, how to cut down on potassium. People think, oh, okay, well, potatoes and bananas. I cut out potatoes and bananas. But also included includes oranges because they're high in potassium. On the other hand, a nectarine isn't. So you can have nectarines. <laughs> right. So our, our goal there through the Kidney Health Clinic is just to inform our patients um, and delay the onset of stage 5 and stage renal disease. So stage and 5 is when the kidneys are no longer working. That's when you would require dialysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you mentioned earlier off uh, that the stage 1, 2, and 3? Well, uh, There's four. five yeah. stages, yeah, depending mm -hmm. on your GFR. Um, but you wouldn't really start dialysis until your GFR, glomerular filtration rate, is less than 15 and you're quite symptomatic. And depending on, you can then delay the process. Yeah, that's our aim is to delay the onset of dialysis and inform our patients of their choices like hemodialysis, home hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, transplant, and get them prepared for what the next step is. And some people can be a GFR of, uh, you know, uh, 20 and feel very bad. Other people, you know, myself included, uh, my GFR was less than 15 and my creatinine was at 600, over 600, uh, whereas normal is 100. Um, but I was completely asymptomatic. I wasn't, well, I was a little tired. I was anemic. Yeah. But other than that, you didn't uh, notice. I really didn't notice. Yeah. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why uh, it took so long yeah. to, to figure, figure it out. Do people notice a difference be between when they come for treatment and after treatment? Do they? Absolutely. Jeff, you could probably comment better. Yeah, uh, in the in the beginning, especially in the beginning, I would find myself very tired after uh, a treatment. Um, I don't feel that so much anymore, and maybe that's psychological. Now it's like I'm just reading while they're doing all this stuff, <laughs> uh, reading or watching TV over their shoulder, and uh, so it doesn't bother me so much. Um, sometimes I have a headache after treatment, um, but then the next day you tend to feel a little bit up, more up. More energetic? Uh, yeah, and especially on days when I get my, uh, uh, what's the drug? Uh, um, EPO? No, yes. Uh, Aranus. Yeah. Yeah, that helps boost uh, hemoglobin. Yeah, because that's one, of the, the other, one of the other things the kidneys do, like we said, blood pressure. It also tells your blood mar uh, bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. And that, of course, carries the oxygen, which gives you energy. Which, so if you yeah. aren't, you're feeling fatigued. Which is why I was fatigued and anemic. Mm -hmm. So, and just uh, last words, if someone is learning that they have to undergo dialysis, what things can you say to them about? Uh, well, it's not the end of the world, uh, you, but you do have to, you have to participate in this. You have to talk to the dietitian. You have to watch your diet. You have, and if you have fluid restrictions, you know, if, if you're still urinating, then it's not so bad. But the less you urinate, the more fluid buildup you're going to get, the less fluid you can, you have to take in. And uh, I know that there's been people that come in and you guys are going, wow, we've got to take a lot of fluid off this person. Other people, myself included, like... Um, the more compliant you are, the easier your yeah. treatments are going to be. Yeah. I am, it's also a process, it sounds like, because you've got to learn about the whole... You do. Oh, you, yeah. you have to Lots of education yeah. is yeah. involved. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to participate in your own health. Which we recommend for everyone. Everybody has to, but it's more acute <laughs> uh, for people on dialysis. Thank you both. This has been a fascinating topic. Thanks again for having us. Yeah. And thank you for watching Sitting with Sally. We will see you next time.